The final item of business is Members' Business Debate on Motion 11174 in the name of Liam Kerr on increasing awareness of restorative justice within the criminal justice system. The debate will be concluded without any questions being put and I would ask those who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons. And I call on Liam Kerr to open the debate for around seven minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm very pleased to bring forward this Members' Debate today and I thank all of those across the Chamber who added their support to the motion, either in direct support or to allow this important matter to be debated. Now, I entitled this motion Increasing Awareness of Restorative Justice Within the Criminal Justice System and if nothing else, I think this de debate will achieve that. So, what is restorative justice? Well, at times it can feel like we try to empower those who break the law more than victims. One former police officer's comments are worth reading out in this regard. He said, common feedback from victims and witnesses was the feeling that they were on the outside looking in. And once they had given their statement, they often heard nothing further until receiving a citation to attend court. In many cases, this came as a surprise. They had expected to be contacted when the alleged offender had been traced and spoken to uh, in order that they be involved in the decision-making process, given that they are the ones who have been most affected by the incident. The concept of restorative justice seeks to address this. The Scottish University's Insight Institute defines it as a process that brings together those harmed by crime and those responsible for that harm to safely discuss the harm and how it might be set right. In essence, then, it is some form of voluntary, on both sides, communication between the offender and victim, which takes place in a safe manner and environment in which the offender must be prepared to admit responsibility. But crucially, there is no need for victims to forgive. Joanna Shapland, the chair of the Scottish Restorative Justice Forum, says the process allows victims and their families to ask questions which will be familiar to all those of us who've been a victim of crime, such as, why me? Are you sorry for what you did? And what are you doing to change your behavior? And to look the offender in the eye and receive an apology. It includes victims in the process that follows in the aftermath of a crime and allows them to confront offenders with the real human impact of their wrongdoing. But crucially, and on this we must be clear, none of this replaces a formal trial to establish the guilt of the offender. And it works. An academic evaluation of three schemes in England found up to 83% of victims to whom restorative justice was offered wanted to take part. Those who did appreciated the offender meeting them, answering questions, and the opportunity to receive a direct apology, which is not normally possible in the criminal justice process. An outcome agreement, being an agreement between the parties for some kind of appropriate restoration, was reached in 98% of cases. International research consistently shows very high rates of participant satisfaction, with typically over 80% of respondents saying they found the process helpful and are pleased that they did it and would recommend it to others. Better for the victims and better for society. But there's something else here. Presiding officer, Scotland's reconviction rate has barely changed in 17 years. According to the University of Sheffield research, restorative justice processes significantly reduce the frequency of reoffending. Figures from New Zealand over a five-year period show that offenders who took part in restorative justice had a 15% lower rate of reoffending and committed 26% fewer offences overall than an appropriately constituted control group. So the principles appear to be sound, but we are not doing it to any great degree. The Scottish Government last year published guidance for the delivery of restorative justice in Scotland. It is good guidance, and I welcome it. But guidance doesn't work unless it is used. So when asked what restorative justice is, nearly half of local authorities either didn't know or supplied an answer that substantially contradicts the Scottish Government's own definition. Only five of our 32 local councils offer any sort of restorative justice service for adults. The Cabinet Secretary's predecessor, Kenny McCaskill, said of restorative justice that there has been a failure to take action as a natural consequence of it not being made a ministerial priority. Now, I may be wrong, presiding officer, but I think that's political speak for I ignored this when I was a minister. Steve Kirkwood and Mary Munro, academics at the Universities of Edinburgh and Strathclyde, respectively, are clear 
that the relative neglect in Scotland is rather odd, given developments of restorative justice in other parts of the UK, across Europe and in jurisdictions across the world. We need to get these services up and running. That's the first step to creating a justice system that puts victims at its heart. That means trained professionals available to facilitate the communication. It means informing victims that this service is available and of their ability to access it. But we also need to be clear what restorative justice is not there for. Of the five councils in Scotland that do offer restorative justice, three do it as a diversion from prosecution. And I find that disappointing. Joanna Shapland, the chair of the Scottish Restorative Justice Forum, is clear. Restorative justice cannot replace a formal trial. And in my view, she's right. Involving victims in the justice process is not a substitute for punishing offenders adequately for the wrongs that they have committed. But victims can be included as part of and alongside the existing justice process. One sheriff has very fairly asked why victims are not part of community payback review hearings. Everyone is represented around that table except the person who has suffered the most from the crime. Wouldn't the public have more confidence in community sentences if victims were able to input into the punishment? And what if the unpaid work carried out by offenders on CPOs had more of a connection with the original offence so that lawbreakers properly understand the impact of their crimes? And what if social workers writing reports for courts and hearings had a greater idea about the specific victim's experience and whether they want to meet the offender and pose their own questions to hopefully achieve some kind of closure? So that is why I wanted a debate on restorative justice, presiding officer. We can send a message out from this chamber that when a crime is committed, we will not forget the victim, the individual whose life is changed, often ir irreparably, through no choice, no fault of their own. If we care about victims, we will make them an essential part of putting things right. And we do that by increasing awareness of restorative justice within the criminal justice system. Thank you. We move to the open debate and I call Phil to McGregor to be followed by Daniel Johnson. Thank Speeches of four minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. And I'd like to take the opportunity to thank William Kerr for bringing the important uh, subject matter to the Chamber. I've got two uh, declarations to make, uh, President Officer, as a PLO to the, the Justice Portfolio and also a uh, registered social worker with the SSC. Um, in the last four years of practice before becoming an MSP, I was a, a worker in the, the justice system. And that's where I want to start picking up from uh, some of Liam Kerr's points. I, I was able to see in the, the justice system the, the value of restorative justice, and it, and it did work indeed, I would say, very well, um, particularly with, with young people. Um, there was a particular focus, focus on that. And um, I witnessed firsthand a lot of times young people actually having a change in attitude, both to their offending and also uh, to the re restorative justice process itself, perhaps maybe being a bit sceptical at first. And there was even one occasion, and I know this isn't the, uh, the, the usual focus or the usual outcome, but there was even one occasion where I witnessed two young people become fast friends through the process. So we do know that it does work and it can be very effective. And, uh, and I agree with the, the points that Liam Kerr uh, made uh, in relation to that. But, but I would like to pick him up on uh, in terms of, you know, saying that there's, there, there's no awareness of it. I mean, I, 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 as I say, I, I worked as a social worker and I was very aware of it, so were all my colleagues, and I would imagine everybody uh, that worked in the, the justice system. And there is a wee bit of flexibility in the community payback order uh, system as well to do that wee bit of work, but you've got to make an assessment whether it's appropriate or not um, to do that, and it's not always the case. Um, it certainly wouldn't be, the case, wouldn't be appropriate to have a standard uh, victims in the, uh, in, in the community payback order means. But I accept the general point made that there's perhaps more there that can be done at an earlier stage. And certainly when I was doing criminal justice social work reports, and I know my colleagues, we would take into account aspects of attitude towards the offence and um, perhaps what the victim's view on it would be. So, you, you know, th th there is maybe more that could be done along those lines, but I think that there is a degree of flexibility um, and it, I wanted to talk about a wee bit of um, a local good uh, practice uh, in North Lanarkshire 2013. The North Lanarkshire Council's restorative justice team, with funding from the Airdrie and Coatbridge Round Table, facilitated the renovation of a school that had been targeted but um, vandalised. Um, and they actually they, they done that work um, uh, with, with offenders that had been through the, 
uh, the community justice system. So it was a, it was a really good example. And I know that the, the uh, Maureen Hughes, the restorative justice service manager at the time was quoted as saying that three out of five people on schemes like that uh, don't go on to re -offend. So that was a pretty powerful quote at the time and it made quite a lot of um, a good local news. Um, so again, again, it picks up on the point of the, the value of restorative justice in the scheme. And I don't think that point's lost on the Scottish Government. I know that the Minister will speak later, but the, the publication of guidance for the delivery of restorative justice in Scotland uh, in October last year outlined the key principles and guidelines for utilising restorative justice. And I, I, I'm pleased that there is this clear commitment uh, to supporting the delivery of this in Scotland. Um, I, I accept the point that um, only a, a small number of local authorities are, are using uh, restorative justice in, you know, in, in terms of, uh, of, of identifying it as that, but I would actually probably say that most uh, local authorities are, are doing that because I think the local authority I worked for, for example, um, probably is one of the figures, is, is one of the, the stats that you talked about, yet we were clearly using it. So there's maybe a wee bit of work to be done there around uh, terms of statistics and stuff like that, just to kind of tighten all that up. But I can see that I'm running out of time. Uh, it's, enough, it's an area that I've got a lot of interest in, and uh, I'll be keeping, um, you know, obviously a close eye on, on how things are going, and I, I, I'm pleased with the steps I have taken, um, you know, to, to bring this forward uh, nationally. And I'll, I'll leave it at that. Daniel Johnson, followed by John Finney. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, can I too thank uh, Liam Kerr for bringing forward this debate? I think it's extremely useful, particularly within the wider context of the justice debate at the moment. And while I don't have any uh, particular interest to declare, I probably should mention uh, to the Chamber that I did study philosophy as an undergraduate. So if I waffle on a little bit about the concept of justice at the beginning, you can blame uh, that choice of studies at a university for that. But I think it is important because I think we're absolutely right to be talking about uh, exploring uh, the justice system and examining whether what we're doing actually works and what we can do to make it better. And I think we are making progress. We've seen the presumption against short sentences. We've seen a, a much greater focus at looking at the underlying causes for crime uh, rather than one that looks particularly to, to, to uh, identify uh, criminals and criminality. And we're also uh, having a, uh, adopting a focus of what works, looking at the practices that actually reduce uh, levels of both offending in the first place but also re-offending. And I think that's absolutely right because I think the traditional model of justice, one that focuses on punishment, is defective. The old model which looked at uh, retribution correction and, and punishment as deterrence is, is fundamentally flawed and it doesn't work because it assumes that somebody uh, who's committing a crime is, is, is going to be A, acting rationally and B, very often these people are victims in the first place. The, the, the people who have suffered adverse childhood experiences or other uh, 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 tragedies in their life. So the thought that punishing uh, uh, is the way to deal with that is fundamentally flawed. But justice is balanced. And I think Liam Kerr made a very good point that sometimes the victim can get lost. But moreover, I think we need to be careful not to treat justice simply as about correcting behaviour. It is about achieving balance. After all, Lady Justice herself not only carries a sword, she carries scales. And I think uh, 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 addressing that balance, you know, uh, restoring balance, is fundamentally important, and I think fundamentally what restorative justice is about. Because while it is about the victim, it also is about the perpetrator confronting their behaviour, understanding the causes and the effects. And I think that is just as an important element of restorative justice as, it, as, as the victim's uh, perspective is within all of this. And I think there can be no better... Um, uh, example of this than the, the example that came to light at the end of last year of Jay Beattie, who, uh, as an 11-year-old uh, with Down syndrome, was, uh, formed part of uh, Celtic celebrations uh, back in uh, 2014, uh, but then suffered uh, abuse online, on social media, appalling abuse. But as part of the steps that were taken subsequently, Jay met with the person who was behind those attacks. And according to the father, that was a very, and I quote, powerful an emotional exchange with the, the perpetrator fundamentally realizing kind of the, what he had done, uh, coming face to face with his victim. And I think that was a very powerful demonstration of how it's not just beneficial for the victim, but it can actually show the, the, the perpetrator the real consequences of what they have done. So the, that two-way process, that two-way element of restorative justice is very important. 
but we must look at how we can actually move forward. We must, I think, confront some of the home truths, because as well as we would like to be progressive, while we look towards being uh, more progressive in terms of the way that we uh, seek to advance uh, criminal justice policy, we still put an awful lot of people away in prison in this country. Um, according to the Council of Europe, we have f uh, 584 entries into prison per 100,000 population. That far outstrips the European average of 167, and even England and Wales is down at around 197. Now, we need to, I think, confront those issues. Why do we put so many people in prison in Scotland, despite all our efforts, despite everything that we've been doing? And I think restorative justice is one uh, element to this, but we must look more broadly about how we can tackle uh, this and, and alter what is a flawed uh, model of criminal justice. Thank you. I don't think you waffled at all, Mr Johnson. John Finney to be followed by Liam MacArthur. Uh, thank you, President Officer. And uh, I too congratulate my colleague uh, Liam um, Kerr on bringing this matter to the Chamber um, when he asked to sign it. Uh, it's many differences of opinion between myself and the Conservative Party, but I think this is a, a subject worthy of debate and, and I enjoyed his and indeed other contributions so far. I'd like to talk in some of the wording that's in that motion because I think it's very important. The motion talks of the importance of restorative justice in complementing because I think it's right to say that there isn't one model. It should be each individual case and its merits as regards the well-being of the victim and the well-being of the accused as well. And it talks about the aims to bring uh, those harmed by crime together with those responsible for crime. And of course, it's very, very important that engagement is appropriate and it doesn't compound any difficulties for either party, but perhaps particularly the victim. Um, and it's for that reason, and again, sticking with the motion there, we talk about the, 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 the use of trained facilitators and their role in, um, in direct and indirect initiatives, such as face-to-face -face meetings, shuttle dialogue, and one that particularly, maybe I should declare an interest given my past career, on police restorative warnings. The most powerful tool that the police officer uh, in Scotland has isn't their CS incapacitant spray, their rigid handcuffs, for some of them a firearm. It is the power of discretion, and it's to exercise that discretion wisely and proportionately. So when the motion also talks about a positive and tailored way forward, I, I think that that's, that, that that's the direction we should go in. Daniel Johnson and others have talked about the direction of the travel, the presumption against short sentences, and, um, and an important word, word again out of the motion, the chance for an apology to be offered in response to crime. It's not only the victim that wants that. Very often, given that most of our crime is committed by uh, young men, and most of these young men are under the influence of drink or drugs at the time, often the next day when it becomes apparent what they've done, they only too readily, some of them would wish to apologise. And then on to the next phrase in the, in, the, in, the, in the motion, empowering the victim. That's very important because the victim has to be in charge of this option, and it is an option. Um, and uh, it's an option which, and, and I'll not repeat the statistics, but um, I'll repeat the phrase that Liam Kerr used, is better for the victim. It's evidenced it's evidenced, um, and that's, that's very important because as a, as a member of the Justice Committee, we struggle with various statistics and uh, competing opinions as to what is and isn't good, and hard empirical evidence is, is, is important. It's not available everywhere, and I, and I think that is an issue, um, but we know that not everything's available to everyone providing a sentence. Um, I, I know in my own area, Murray Youth Justice Team see it. Uh, they work with young offenders aged 8 to 18, um, they are aware of the, the Scottish Government Youth Justice Plan. I saw that from their website this afternoon. And the key objectives to reduce youth offending and the impact this behaviour has on communities throughout Murray is what this says. Now, well, of course, victims are all members of that uh, community of Murray. And in a very short time, I'll say that they have a lengthy list, including acceptable behaviour conduct, contracts, anger management, safer lives programme, independent living, so on and so forth including intensive support and uh, monitoring service, and this is for young people who have a potential to find themselves in secure accommodation uh, arrangements. So in the short time I've left, I want to say that I, I think that this is an opportunity, it's an opportunity that dovetails with 
um, uh, others, where I would disagree with my colleague Liam Kerr is that I would see this as a diversion from prosecution, an alternative to prosecution. I think that that is a positive option. But like everything else, it has to be used proportionately, and the well-being um, of the accused has to be a factor, not least, as I said, because a lot of these people have been under them for the drink of drugs at the time, and the welfare of the victim should be at the forefront. And it's very clear it's not for every victim. Thank you. Liam MacArthur, followed by Oliver Mundell. Thank you very much, Deputy President Officer. Can I join with others in uh, thanking, congratulating uh, Liam Kaya on making uh, this debate uh, possible? And I, I think he was right to emphasise the importance of raising awareness. Can I also congratulate the other speakers in this debate? Because um, I, I have uh, long since realised, since I took on the role as Justice Spokesperson for my party, that one of uh, the key planks of my role is to pay tribute to my predecessor, Alison McInnes, on a regular basis. But I think in this instance, it's very much uh, merited, as uh, she was the, the member that brought forward the amendment uh, during what is now the 2014 Victims and Witnesses uh, uh, Bill Now Act, um, that gave rise to the guidance that we saw published at the end uh, of uh, last year. And uh, I, I think in saying that, I would pay tribute to, to John Finney, who whose, uh, I think, perhaps little local difficulty with these previous party members perhaps released them in order to uh, vote in favour of that amendment at stage two, but pay tribute also to the government, uh, who had a majority at that stage, but did not seek to reverse the amendment at stage, two, and, uh, stage three. And I think that is very much to their uh, credit. I think it's reflected also in the debate that we're having uh, this afternoon, which, if nothing else, um, amplifies and underscores uh, the extent to which we've moved on over that period. There is, a, I think, a better understanding of restorative justice, what it is, what it isn't, how it fits, as Daniel Johnson says, in the wider uh, context of what we want to achieve through our criminal justice uh, scheme, uh, system. It's not, uh, as I think has been uh, previously uh, assumed, some sort of soft option, and it is an option. Uh, in some cases, it is a hard and very challenging uh, option. As Alison McInnes uh, pointed out at the time in moving her amendment, restorative justice services can assist victims to overcome their experiences and provide a form of accountability and a forum uh, in which to receive an apology. At the same time, uh, it can enable those who have committed crimes to reflect on their actions, take personal responsibility, appreciate the harm that they have caused and start uh, to make amends. Uh, and that is... I think, key to uh, rehabilitation of both uh, parties. Um, I know it's felt perhaps to be particularly effective uh, in the cases of uh, youth justice, but it is not exclusively the case. It's also, I think, worth recalling um, that the amendment brought forward in, uh, to the 2014 Act uh, reflected Article 12 of the EU Victims Directive. Uh, which stipulates that member states must, quote, facilitate the referral of cases as appropriate to restorative justice services, including through the establishment of procedures or guidelines on the conditions of such uh, referral. That directive maintains that victims who choose to participate uh, should have access to safe and competent restorative justice uh, services. And I don't think that's yet happening um, uh, enough, uh, although, again, as I say, a progress has been uh, made. There is a better understanding, but the benefits aren't, I think, being properly realised due to the slow and patchy uh, extent of that progress. I think if Alison McInnes were in the chamber uh, now, as well as uh, not sparing her blushes, I think she'd perhaps regret the time it's taken to come forward with that guidance, although I think Liam Kerr rightly pointed out the guidance in of itself uh, is a, a very positive move and I welcome the content uh, within it. Back in 2013, I think Kenny McCaskill uh, was declining the opportunity to set up a short life working group, thinking that might hold things back. Instead, he wanted to meet Alison McInnes and other stakeholders in his office, uh, I think confident that that way uh, swifter progress was to be made. Uh, I think, uh, therefore, it's maybe a bit disappointing that um, it then took three years for the guidance to be uh, produced. But there is an opportunity now to press on. Uh, I, Steve Kirkwood and, and Mary Monroe from Edmund University were quoted earlier. I, I noticed um, in writing for Scottish Justice Matters, they observed recently that despite the political support, and that's been very evident again this evening, there are still too few services offering restorative justice to victims and offenders. Those that exist tend to be for younger people who have committed lower tariff offences, and some activity that is labelled restorative justice 
is not. So I think we can take some reassurance from uh, the tone of the debate uh, that we're having this evening. It will, as Liam Kerr indicated at the outset, help raise that awareness. But I think we've got some way to go uh, in realising the full potential, uh, both for victims, but also uh, for those who may offend uh, or be likely to re-offend, um, as, we, as we would all wish to do. But again, I thank Liam Kerr for allowing us this opportunity this evening. Thank you very much indeed. Oliver Mundell, to be followed by Lewis MacDonald. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. I start by saying uh, to Liam MacArthur that I'm very confident that one day uh, someone else will stand up in this chamber and, and compliment uh, his efforts in the, the justice brief. Uh, but uh, like uh, other members, I'd like to start by thanking uh, the other Liam, Liam uh, Kerr for bringing this motion uh, to the chamber this evening and affording myself and other members the opportunity to talk about this important issue. Uh, but more importantly than talking about it, I've already enjoyed the opportunity to listen to others. And I think we've heard a number of uh, considered contributions already from across the chamber. And whilst uh, there'll be no philosophy here, uh, I, I have uh, enjoyed the different takes. And I think it is important to remember that despite whatever political differences exist between the parties uh, on uh, justice issues, there is a lot of uh, common ground um, and this is a good example uh, of where we can build consensus and improve uh, the experience of the criminal justice system uh, for, for everyone. Uh, restorative justice provides the opportunity for a victim uh, of crime and I was interested actually in John Finney's point around uh, the opportunities it offers offenders as well to experience justice in a comprehensive and, and different way uh, rather than uh, just through uh, the prosecution and sentencing process alone. Um, I think it allows uh, the offender to, to fully face up to the consequences of their actions and better understand the process uh, that led them there in the first place. And I think that is why the evidence from elsewhere around the world uh, shows that it is so successful uh, because rather than uh, simply focusing on punishment, it allows uh, for that reflection. Um, and unlike uh, mediation, uh, restorative justice doesn't offer a moral uh, playing field uh, that, that's, that, that's level. Um, what, what it does is recognise that a wrong uh, has been done. And it's both uh, for that reason um, a victim-led process, uh, but also one uh, that the offender has to uh, be part of and drive as well. Um, and when it's used effectively, as we've uh, heard, international research has shown that over 80% of participants in restorative justice initiatives found the process helpful. I don't think uh, you'd hear the same figure in relation to other criminal justice uh, proceedings. Um, and it's therefore a little bit disappointing, and I'm not uh, seeking to, to make a big point of it, but that Scotland seems um, certainly in some areas to be, to be lagging behind. Um, and obviously, uh, I note the point that uh, Fulton McGregor makes in relation to uh, his own constituency and past experiences, but certainly mine uh, as a member representing a more rural community, uh, patchy provision across many aspects of criminal justice uh, you know, is, is, is in part inevitable, uh, but in part exists in, an, in, in, in a way uh, that is unhelpful and I think with more uh, support and focus uh, could be addressed. Um, and I think uh, one of the other um, points that I'd, I'd like to, to draw on is, is just uh, around the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Inquiry, some of which uh, I uh, saw when I was on the Justice Committee, uh, where we heard a lot of evidence about the breakdown in communication um, and I think, uh, most of all, um, if restorative justice has any benefit, um, the one I would single out as a key benefit is, is that ability to start a dialogue, uh, start a conversation uh, and address misinformation. Obviously, it's not going to be for everyone. Um, it's a forum that sits alongside uh, the formal trial process. And I think it's not right in every case and it's not intended necessarily always uh, to replace prosecution and sentencing. 
but rather recognises that prosecution and sentencing is only one dimension to achieve justice for victims and rehabilitation for offenders. Thank you, President Officer. The last of the open debate contributions is from Lewis MacDonald. Thank you very much, and I congratulate Liam Kerr on bringing this debate, and I commend the principles of restorative justice which he has described. It can be tempting, as we have heard, to think about restorative justice as an alternative to action under the existing justice system. But I agree with Liam Kerr that we should resist that temptation. The experience of existing alternatives to prosecution suggests that restorative justice cannot be based on goodwill alone. Restitution needs to be enforceable, and that principle must apply in future too. Requiring offenders to meet their victims and to apologize for their crimes can encourage offenders to face up to the consequences of their actions, perhaps make them think twice about committing another crime and help reduce reoffending overall. But restorative justice is equally important for victims. Their recovery can be helped by the knowledge that offenders have paid a price for their crimes and paid their debts to society, whether that is through a community sentence uh, or through financial compensation to the victim. When victims do not see justice being done, by contrast, measures intended to deliver restorative justice can actually undermine their faith in the justice system. My constituent, Michelle Gavin, for example, has had that experience. Two years ago, she was the victim of damage to her property when a man entered her garden. The bill ran into hundreds of pounds. The Crown Office took the apparently reasonable decision to offer the offender the option of paying compensation direct to his victim, so that the offender need not be taken to court and the victim would benefit from a form of restorative justice. Two years later, with not a penny paid, that fiscal compensation offer is something which Michelle Gavin has had cause to regret. The offender has not paid. The Crown is effectively unable to do anything about it. He has been arrested on warrant, detained in custody, and taken to court for non-payment, not once, but three times. On each occasion, the Justice of the Peace has set new payment terms and told the offender he should pay the compensation, but to no avail. If this was a fine imposed by the courts, fines enforcement officers employed by the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service would be able to take action, but because this was a fiscal compensation offer, there is no effective sanction which fines enforcement officers can take. Critically, offenders who have received a fiscal compensation offer are under no obligation to complete a declaration of in in income form. Without that, fines enforcement officers cannot know whether offenders are in work or on benefits, they cannot identify bank accounts or arrest wages or benefits or savings. So if a fines enforcement officer encourages an offender to provide such information on a voluntary basis and the offender's defence agent does not, the outcome sadly is all too predictable. Not only that, but when it comes to fines and compensation offers issued by fiscals, courts cannot impose an alternative sentence as they, as they would for fines imposed by a court like a community payback order, so there is no incentive for the offender to pay up. So in a case like Michelle Gavin's, an effort to achieve restorative justice without the full powers of enforcement available under the traditional justice system has actually done the opposite of what was intended. In such a case, the victim loses faith in the justice system, the offender does not require to change behaviours, and justice is not seen to be done. So as we go further down the road of restorative justice, as I believe and, and very strongly believe that we should, we need to learn those lessons in order to achieve the desired results. Thank you. I now call on Annabel Ewing to respond to the debate for around seven minutes, please, Minister. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I congratulate uh, also uh, Liam Kerr on securing this uh, uh, debate on restorative justice uh, this afternoon, and I thank all members. Uh, for their interesting uh, contributions. Over the last decade, Scotland has become a safer place with less crime and the better support for victims. Restorative justice offers as an opportunity to build on this progress. Restorative justice can, crucially, provide victims with the chance to have their voice heard and their questions answered. It can also help tackle the likelihood of someone being drawn into further offending. It is a particularly powerful tool when used to address the behaviour of young people who can learn so much from a dialogue with those harmed by their actions. This can potentially lead to a route out of crime and the revolving door of the justice system. 
However, we are keen that the main benefit is felt by victims of crime, giving them an opportunity to communicate the impact on their lives and to regain some control. Our vision is to have high quality restorative justice services available across Scotland. Our vision includes the, the need to have uh, the, the, the victim's interests and needs uh, at the very heart of the restorative justice process and if ensuring that further harm is avoided. And also, uh, we recognise the need to build public awareness, as has been referred to tonight, uh, and indeed understanding of what restorative, restorative justice is and the benefits it can uh, uh, deliver. Uh, as a step towards achieving this vision, we published uh, guidance for the delivery of restorative justice in Scotland uh, in October last year, as has been referred to. This guidance was in fact developed in partnership with a range of stakeholders, uh, most not notably the members of the Restorative Justice Forum, which includes Police Scotland, SACRO, Victim Support Scotland, uh, amongst others. And, Presiding Officer, I would like to take this opportunity to thank uh, Forum members for their contribution and also for their role in championing restorative justice over the years. The guidance is aimed at practitioners and facilitators. It sets out the principles that need to be followed in a restorative justice process. A key principle is that participation in the process must be voluntary for both the victim and the person who has caused the harm. This is an important, important point worth stressing. Uh, yes, we do want to, to see and need to raise awareness of uh, restorative justice, but we need to do so in a manner that recognises that there is no obligation on either party to participate. Now that the guidance has been published, uh, we plan to consult by the end of this year on an order under Section 5 of the Victims and Witnesses Act 2014 to prescribe which bodies must have regard to it. In addition to publishing the new guidance document, we also wanted to get a better understanding of the current provision of restorative justice in local areas throughout Scotland. Uh, and we have therefore surveyed local authority, uh, community and youth justice teams to investigate how restorative justice is currently being delivered and to help identify any barriers that may be hindering its use. Uh, uh, we aim to publish our survey findings before the summer recess uh, and uh, hopefully that will help uh, respond to some of the points made tonight on that very uh, subject. But we, we do see evidence that there is good work uh, already underway uh, in a number of areas. For example, stakeholders in Aberdeen are working with Community Justice Scotland and SACRO to increase and improve diversion from prosecution. This includes the provision of access to restorative justice services. In Shetland, the Space to Face project, <laughs> certainly. The constituent to whom I referred earlier <laughs> was indeed in Aberdeen, and I wonder if she would <laughs> accept the point that in taking that uh, exploration forward, uh, a regard has to be had to the need to enforce where there is a diversion for justice if that diversion for justice is not honoured uh, by the offender. That was Lewis MacDonald. This is now Annabelle Yuk. <laughs> Um, I, I heard the point that the, the member made uh, about his uh, constituent, and I'm not entirely sure whether that has been the subject of correspondence with the Scottish Government or, or not, but uh, the member is nodding his head. Uh, what I would say, of course, as regards any decision made by the local fiscal as to how to proceed in any given case is not a matter for ministers. But I do note the point that the member raises, uh, the wider point, perhaps, about um, enforcement uh, in circumstances where fiscal compensation orders are imposed, and I will ensure uh, that that is drawn to the attention of officials, and we will have a look at that. But in Shetland, in the Space to Face project, this enables young offenders to work with trained artists to make a gift of artwork for the person they have harmed. Offences in, included within uh, this, uh, the, 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 the area that this project have, has covered have included assault, cyberbullying, theft, breach of the peace, fraud and vandalism. And in Edinburgh, restorative justice processes are being developed for those serving community payback orders related to hate crime. To support this work, an information sharing protocol has been developed and staff have been trained in the delivery of restorative justice. Presiding officer, these uh, examples demonstrate how uh, restorative justice processes can be tailored to local need. They also highlight some of the challenges associated with the expansion of restorative justice provision across uh, the country. Challenges such as how and when to contact victims. Indeed, each victim's journey is unique, as is the point at which they may feel willing and able to participate in a restorative justice process. In some cases, this may be months or, or even years. Uh, in other cases, uh, uh, in terms of when the crime was committed. 
Contact protocols which recognise this challenge and which are compliant with data protection legislation are therefore required. We also need to ensure that high quality training is available for restorative justice facilitators. This is essential to ensure services are of a consistent standard and are carried out safely and effectively. A third challenge and one that this debate is helping indeed to address and that point has been made by speakers tonight is that we need to build public awareness and understanding of restorative justice and the benefits it can deliver. We need to promote restorative justice as an option that runs in tandem with and complements the mainstream criminal justice system. It is not a replacement for it, nor indeed, uh, as Liam MacArthur said, a soft option for those who do harm. And I believe that the cross-party support provided to this motion and indeed the, the welcome tone of the debate tonight, uh, presiding officer, do well illustrate that we have achieved a good degree of consensus uh, on, on these points. Finally, there is a need for clarity on the roles and responsibilities of all those involved in encouraging, managing and delivering restorative justice in Scotland. This will require commitment and support from local authorities, public sector bodies and third sector partners and volunteers. So, the challenges are clear and we are committed to providing strategic leadership to address them. We will build on the momentum of our work to date and consider how best to encourage the development and delivery of restorative justice in Scotland. One potential option could be the development of a national strategic framework to inform work at a local level, ensuring access to existing restorative justice services and the development of further provision to meet the needs of victims. We are working with Community Justice Scotland to scope out our next steps. Consultation and engagement with stakeholders, including local authorities and the Restorative Justice Forum will follow. To conclude, presiding officer, we want restorative justice to be a key component of our justice system, empowering victims and enabling offenders to take responsibility and to make amends. We will continue to work with our partners to turn this vision into a reality. Thank you, presiding officer. That concludes the debate and the meeting's closed.